And uh, I, I want to just encourage you this morning to, to take another look at God. I want you to take another look at God. In fact, I want you to spend most of your moments for the rest of your life taking another look at God. Just taking another look. Because when you look at the Lord from a different angle, when you look again, you always see something different. See, we, we use this word called wonderful, right? That's wonderful. This is wonderful. This water burger is wonderful. It, it is. It is. But really, when we talk about wonderful, what we're saying is something is filled with wonder, and we talk about God, we're talking about a God who is filled with absolute wonder. And get this, his wonder is endless. And so when I invite you to look again, what I'm inviting you to is to get to a place where you look at a God who is filled with wonder and you go, wow, I'm blown away once again. Did you know that you could wake up every morning and discover something new about God? And not just tomorrow, and not just 10 years from now, but did you know for the next 10 billion years, when you open up your eyes, God is so fascinating that he can reveal something new to you. He is a God filled with wonder. That word wonder means this, the cause of astonishment or admiration. And many people are lost in wondering about God. God, are you going to take care of me? God, are you going to provide for me? God, are you going to save my kids? God, am I going to have a job tomorrow? But few get caught up in the wonder of God. And that's what I want to invite you into today. See, Jesus was filled with wonder. Absolutely. Look at this. Jesus was filled with wonderful words. Matthew chapter 7, verse 28, it says, The crowds, the multitudes, were amazed by his teaching. For he taught with real authority. So they had all these guys teaching. They had good things to say. But there was something about Jesus that was different. When he taught, he had authority. And it says that they were amazed by what he had to say. He was filled with wonder-filled words. And also Jesus had wonder-filled works, right? It says this, Luke chapter 5, verse 26. Everyone was amazed and gave praise to God. And they were filled with awe and said, we have seen remarkable things today. You know what remarkable things are? Remarkable things are where you'll make a mark about it because it was so incredible. That you took note, that you took a moment, you said, man, that was phenomenal. I hope I never forget this. And this is what Jesus carried in his life. That word that we're using right there for wonder or for awe is, is, is the word ecstasis. And it's where we get the word ecstasies from. It's, it's where we get that word bewildered or perplexed. It means to be amazed. It, it can actually be, mean to be caught up in a trance. Have you ever been so fascinating? I remember a couple years ago, I, I took my, my we, have, we have two sets of kids. We have older kids and we have two younger kids. We thought we were done and then we decided to have more. I don't know if anybody else is in that boat, but it's, but it's kind of fun. It's like you get to try it again. And so I, I took the older kids to see this Into the Spider-Verse. I think that's what it's called, the Into the Spider-Verse. It's an animation film about Spider-Man and all these, and I was totally not interested at all. I was just, I'm just not really into the animation thing, but, but the bigs wanted to go, so we go to the theater, and we're watching this movie, and for the next two hours, I am bewildered. I'm locked into this thing. I'm not on my phone. I'm not distracted. I'm distracted by one thing the thing that I'm fascinated by. And it, was, it took me away from all the, the notifications, took me away from all the, the stress that I had. I was just totally locked into this thing, the, the creativity that was in this. And, and listen, if I can do that to a film, <laughs> come on, for two hours, then the God of endless beauty surely has enough within him to captivate my wonder. And I'm telling you that God wants to bring you into a place to whenever you come into worship that it's not just setting you up for the message so you can go home and check the church box. No, God wants to reveal himself to you in such a way that you are lost in his beauty. That all of a sudden the, the, the thing that carries the most weight in your life is not the stress that you have about your finances or are my kids making good decisions. No, the thing that you're going to be caught up most in is God, you are so glorious and beautiful and I can't get enough of you. And he is, listen, he wants to be the ultimate distraction in your life. And so Jesus carries this and people are abandoning their lives to follow him, 
He was incredibly wonder-filled, and this drew people in. It says in Mark chapter 9, 15, as soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed. When's the last time you've been overwhelmed by God? Can I suggest to you today that the last time that you got overwhelmed by God was the last time you looked deeply. That was the last time you got over, because he's always got something. All kinds of people ran out to meet him. As soon as they saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and ran out to greet him. They ran out to greet him. And, and there's this story in Luke chapter 19 that I want to share with you today about a man that also ran out to meet him. And you guys know him. His name's Zacchaeus. You guys remember that? Remember when you were in Sunday school and, and maybe if you went to Sunday school or kids' church and they had this song that says Zacchaeus was a wee little man, right? I, I don't think that'd be PC to, see, to sing these days. But uh, we used to sing this song about this little guy and how he climbed up in the sycamore tree. I'm going to share that story today. Let's, re- let's revisit this. Luke chapter 19, verse 1. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus, and he was a chief. Everybody say chief. Tax collector. Say tax collector. And he was wealthy. Uh Uh-oh. And he wanted to see who Jesus was. But being a short man, he couldn't because of the crowd. (laughs) It's like like he's at a concert. He's like, oh, man, can I get on somebody's shoulders, right? We've seen that. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. And when Jesus reached the spot, when Jesus showed up, he looked looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I'm going to stay at your house today. Jesus is inviting himself over. (laughs) Come on, Jesus. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, He has gone to be a guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. And Jesus said to them, today, today, Zacchaeus, salvation has come to this house because this man, too, is a son of Abraham. That's very important, a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. He's talking about Zacchaeus, a lost son of Abraham. And Jesus says, I'm come to seek and to save people just like Zacchaeus. See, Zacchaeus had issues. Come on, I know you got issues. Zacchaeus had them too. See, the first thing is Zacchaeus was a chief tax collector of Jericho, a prominent city. The chief, he's the head of all the other tax collectors, and this is him. And he's showing up, and he's looking for Jesus. And that ain't okay, because he's a tax collector. We know tax collectors, come on. He's a dirty politician. He's a mobster. He's an extortionist. He's known, this, this is why they were dirty, is because they, they would collect the taxes and keep a little for themselves. And we know that by Zacchaeus' admission that he was probably doing this. And he was considered a sinner. This was his identity. It wasn't just a chief tax collector who was rich. The people thought he was a sinner. And they were right. He was a traitor. Here's here's a man, Zacchaeus, a Jewish name, now working for the opposition, working for the opposers, working for the oppressors, working for Rome and collecting taxes. So he would have been considered by all the Jewish people a lost son of Abraham. You're out. You're no longer part of our family. You're here to collect taxes. So he was a chief tax collector, a sinner. Secondly, he was rich. Now, we see all throughout the Scriptures that a lot of times there's nothing wrong with having money, but there's something wrong with money having you. And this was the case often in the Scriptures. And money had Zacchaeus. He was wealthy. 
How did he get wealthy? Well, he's a tax collector. We know how he got wealthy. Robbery. Treason. And he's a sinner. And then we see this third thing about him is that he was small. He was born with natural limitations, right? He was just the way he was. He had these innate disabilities. Now, most scholars would agree that Zacchaeus, because of the Jewish culture of the day, was was a little bit shorter than American culture, believed that Zacchaeus was probably under five foot tall. He was a little guy. And it made it difficult for him to see Jesus. And so here he is. I hear Jesus is coming to town. I've got all these accusations against me, but I've got this limitation, but I've got this problem. I can't see the crowd. However, he had this incredible attribute of allowing his fascination with Jesus to override his limitations. Do you have something inside of you that says, you know what, I want to see Jesus. And I know I might have been, quote, unquote, born this way. I know I might have this personality trait, or I'm not passionate, or I'm not an extrovert, or an introvert, or number four on the Enneagram, or whatever your limitation is. Will you be caught up with fascination and stop making excuses through your limitation? He was filled with wonder. And one of the things that, that, that cripples us in our pursuit of Jesus, is we kind of lose this ability to wonder. I remember in 1993 when I came to the Lord in my bedroom, I started looking at this glorious man that I'd been hearing about for a couple of years. And I've been serving the Lord for almost three decades. And I can tell you I've never lost my wonder because every day I wake up and I look again I'm not perfect, and I got issues, but I've got this big obsession in my life. I've got this big fascination in my life with Jesus and who he is, and that helps keep me on track. And one of the things that, that happens as we get a little older is we kind of lose that ability to wonder, right? We, we allow worry to rob us of wonder. We start worrying about the bills and all the worries of life. Remember, Jesus talks about this. Don't get caught up in a worry. For others of us, we get comfortable with Jesus. We come in, we sing songs about his name, we hear teaching about him, like, yeah, yeah, I know Jesus, I know Jesus, Jesus is this, Jesus is that. But have you rediscovered the Lord lately? Have you discovered him in a new light? And so when we talk about losing wonder What we're talking about is is losing a child-likeness, right? Because children don't have a problem with that. They can be fascinated with anything. No worries, no concerns, no cares, but we lose that. And so we see in Zacchaeus, we see that he doesn't just have a fascination. He actually has kind of like a, he's kind of acting like a kid. He's kind of got a childlike wonder because if you know anything about Jewish culture, you're not supposed to run if you're older, I mean, here's this rich guy running like he can't pay somebody to run for him. Like he can't pay somebody to climb a tree for or set him up in the tree. No, no, no. He allowed his fascination to say, I'm going to get in front of where Jesus, I think I know where Jesus is going, so I'm going to run. I know it might look a little foolish. I I know it it might look a little bit childish, but I'm willing to run. And then we have this guy climbing the tree. I mean, you imagine, you're there, this crowd, hey, just Jesus, what's this dude doing over here, this little old stinky sinner man, why is he climbing that tree? I mean, just the imagery is crazy, he's like a kid. What grown-up does that? How immature, how irresponsible. He could fall down and break a leg and not be able to provide for his family. But this is exactly what the Lord is looking for. Jesus says this in Luke chapter 18, verse 15. One day, some parents brought their children to Jesus so that he could touch and bless them. But when the disciples, his followers, saw this, those who were familiar with the Lord, they scolded the parents for bothering him. 
Then Jesus called for the children and said to his disciples, let the children come to me. Don't stop them, for the kingdom of God belongs to those who are like these children. Now, now some people say the kingdom is for the children. Jesus says this, that are like children. Those that, a, that have not got caught up in worry. Those that have not got caught up in the weight of life. But those that will be caught up in the wonder of who I am. For I tell you the truth, anyone who does not receive the kingdom like a child will never enter it. So listen, Jesus isn't endorsing immaturity or irresponsibility. He's not endorsing childishness, but childlikeness. And beloved, we've got to get back to this place. See, the reason why we have to come in as a kid like a child is because we're not coming into a system. We're coming into a family. We're coming to re- into a relationship with the Father. And so Zacchaeus had this. First of all, he had this childlike wonder. First of all, he was curious. Are you curious about the Lord? And the, one of the enemies of curiosity is knowledge. Right? God wants us to pursue him with holy curiosity. I, I think we need to get to the point where we ask God why, but not why in the sense that we're accusing him. God, why is this happening to me? But, but more in the sense that when we're in the moment of difficulty that we go, God, who are you? God, who are you? I need you to reveal yourself as father. I need you to reveal yourself as friend. I need you to reveal yourself as healer. Who are you? So he, and this is the thing, because what we do is many times when, when God seems mysterious, which he is, is we kind of put him in that box and we go, okay, God's mysterious, and then we walk away. But listen, God is inviting you to explore his mystery. He is mysterious, but he's not unsearchable. And he wants to be found of you. It says in Proverbs 25, verse 2, it says, It is the glory of God to conceal of matter, but it's the glory of kings to search that matter out. So you, as sons and daughters, as, as the kinghood, as the priesthood of the kingdom of God, God has put in you a desire to seek him out. His mystery is not, is not a... It is not a a a blocked wall his mystery is an open door he's saying come in come on won't you just come in won't you just come in and search me out i give you jesus who tore the veil so you can come and explore my mystery and we're going to be doing it beloved forever so there's some things that that squelch curiosity the first is this making excuses i'm too short i'm too vertically challenged right I can't see Jesus. Oh, well, I guess it wasn't for me. I mean, if the Lord wanted me to see him, he would have made me taller. This is the exact thing that we do all the time. We make excuses. I'm disqualified. I, have a, I wasn't raised in church. I came from addiction. It's not the way I am. It's not the way I was raised. Second thing is this, being unteachable. Listen, 18-year-old, the best, thing, the best words that you can learn to say right now in your life is, I don't know. Learn something. What's awesome, if you'll humble yourself, is what's awesome is the older that you get, the more that you realize that you don't know. <laughs> I find myself calling my dad and asking him for advice more now than I did 20 years ago. It's a good place to be. Don't be a know-it-all. Don't be the smartest person in the room. Because sometimes the biggest problem we have is what we do know. Well, I do know this. I do have this experience. The next thing is this, is just looking elsewhere. We're distracted. We've got all, we, we say that God's first. We say that he's central, but we're totally consumed by all these other things. We're looking elsewhere. We're looking elsewhere. You know, John, Pastor Josh was sharing a little bit about about John and in, in Revelation earlier. You know, John was the disciple that survived. They couldn't kill him. He's the only disciple that we have record of getting in close enough to Jesus to hear his heart when he rests his head on his chest. And he's the only disciple that is exiled because he couldn't be killed to an island called Patmos where he has the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's not the revelation of the end times. It's the revelation of Jesus where he begins to unfold all this beauty about Jesus that he didn't even know and he spent three years with Jesus. He heard his heart. Now he's seeing it. 
And he's talking about things like holy, holy, holy. He's, he, he gets into teenager mode with his language. If you ever read the book of Revelation, he's like, he's kind of like uh, Jasper. And he's, it's kind of like Sar Sardius stone. And it's like a sea of glass. Like Everybody's like, what does that mean? John didn't know. He's just trying to put language to it. But he's totally fascinated. Listen, this is, this is what your prayer journal needs to look like. It was like. I was, couldn't look anywhere else, <laughs> right? Just, I was caught up. Ecstasious. Ecstasis. Listen, let him be your distraction. Through your curiosity, let him be the distraction from all the drama of humanity. You, you want to stop the scroll? Get, get in the scroll, right? You want to stop the scroll? Gaze into the eyes of Jesus. Spend some time with the Lord. If, listen, I will tell you this. If you are bored spiritually, it's because you're not looking. Look again. Man, I'm just bored with this God thing. I know this God thing. Look again. Look again. Encounter him again. Number two is this. First of all, he had that curiosity. Number two, he had joy and gladness. This, this is also another childlike thing, right? He's like, oh, okay. Now, it's, it's obvious this joy reciprocates, right? So it's obvious that Jesus wasn't like, Zacchaeus, get your, you filthy sinner. I mean, if he said that, he wouldn't have came down gladly. He would have came down humbly with his head, you know, his tail between his legs. But instead, he comes down and welcomes him gladly. So that tells us that Jesus is looking at him. He's like, Zacchaeus. Look at you. You old man climbing that tree. You little sinner. <laughs> I saw you stole that money, you sucker. Get down. Come on down. We're, I mean, at your house today. It's obvious that Jesus' tone was that way by the way that Zacchaeus responds. And many times we think when the Lord is calling us to something, we don't welcome him gladly because we perceive him as he's frustrated. Like he's some kind of like out of control micromanaging lunatic. That's kind of how we treat God. Gonna... No, no, listen. Jesus makes this statement in Luke chapter 12, verse 32. It gives your, 32, it says, it gives your father great happiness to give you the kingdom. So the Lord isn't like, well, you, I'm mad at you, so you want the kingdom. No, he's like, come on. It's so much better than what you have. Would you come on down? I'm coming over to your house today. And what does Zacchaeus do? He says, Lord, what they're saying is true. I'm going to give them the money back. I'm going to sell half my possessions. I've been doing it wrong, which tells us that probably half of, only half of his possessions were earned honestly. He says, Lord, I'll get rid of half of them. And if I've cheated anybody, I have, I'll give them their money back. Gladly he does this. Whereas we see in a couple chapters later, Jesus encounters a rich man who goes away sad. Because he wasn't willing to abandon all. But here Zacchaeus responds gladly because he gets a glimpse of the beauty of Jesus. Listen, there is a supernatural power in joy. A supernatural power in joy. Can I tell you that, that, that joy is as much of the fruit of the Spirit as self-discipline? And some of you need to get your joy back. You need to get your joy back. Because holiness that isn't happy isn't holiness. And we, we, we learned this thing, you know, when I came into the faith that everybody that was holy was mad all the time and miserable. We're doing work for God. Like you get some kind of merit for being miserable. Oh, if you hate it, God, you're really pleasing the Lord. Where did we get that? It's enjoyable. Enjoy Jesus. And where is joy found? Joy is found in fellowship with Jesus. That's where it's found. I'm coming to your house today. I want to come over. What's interesting about Zacchaeus is he doesn't send out a text to his wife saying, hey, get the house clean. <laughs> Jesus is coming over. No, he climbs down the tree and he gets his life clean. He says, I'm going to line everything up, Lord. So how do we cultivate childlikeness? Real quick. How do we get there? How do we cultivate this childlike wonder? Number one, 
go out on a limb? Will you do what Zacchaeus did? Will you go out on a limb? Will you try something with the Lord? Will you, will you, will you maybe, maybe carve out an hour of your day? Maybe you'll carve out 20 minutes of your day. Maybe you'll just quit to podcast or books or whatever you do in your car. And maybe you'll just spend that time. Maybe you'll just go out on a limb to spend some time with the Lord. When was the last time you got uncomfortable to pursue the Lord? Because it wasn't comfortable out on a limb. It cost him his dignity. Has your pursuit of God, beloved, has your pursuit of God been met with your level of comfort? Because if that's the case, you're going to stay where you're at. Because you never grow in the comfortable. The second is this, is posture yourself. Embrace your identity in Jesus. Posture yourself before him. See, everyone is calling Zacchaeus a sinner, and rightfully so. He's working for Rome. He's a traitor. He's guilty of treason. But Jesus looks at Zacchaeus, and he doesn't call him a sinner. Get this. Zacchaeus never tells Jesus his name. We have no record. And Jesus calls out, and he says, Zacchaeus. Do you know what Zacchaeus means? Zacchaeus is a Hebrew name. It's a Jewish name. It's a son of Abraham's name. And Jesus identifies him by what he created him to be. The name Zacchaeus means pure. Everyone else is calling him sinner. And Jesus goes, pure one, come down. I'm eating at your house today. Prophetically calling him pure. Listen, I don't know where you're at today in your relationship with the Lord. I don't know where you're at in your pursuit of Jesus. Maybe you've been in this thing for a long time. I'm telling you, he's calling you into your identity as a son of Abraham. And a son of Abraham is a son of God. I want you today to, to respond. And we're going to have a moment of worship here in just a moment to the invitation. I'm coming over to your house. Did you know that the Lord is in this house today? And he wants fellowship with you. He wants to spend time with you today. He doesn't want you to just check the worship box. He doesn't want you to just check the, did I get a little feels, a few little, you know, uh, pokies on my arm when the, when the band started singing and they said, oh, I really like that song. Listen, it's more than a song. It's a meeting. It's fellowship with Jesus. So here he is. Born a Jew. Working for Rome. Lost. Just a lost sheep. And this is exactly what he was considered. Sinner. If you'll just bow your head all across this room. Some of you who walked in this room today. And that it, you know that's your identity. You know you're not right with God. Others of you, you've just been struggling. And I'm right with the Lord. I'm following the Lord, but I, I just... I feel lost. Jesus finishes up this story with this very powerful statement. In verse 10, he reinstates him into the family. He says, the son of man came to seek. The God of wonder came to seek. Jesus is also a seeker. He's seeking human hearts. He came to seek and to save that which is lost. Are you lost today?
Thank you for joining us online today. Make sure and hit subscribe to this channel and hit the bell for more notifications. We can't wait to engage with you this week.